It can only be attributable to human error. You're Where will we go next? It's a phantom from another time. No one, Mr. Mama. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. That is one good pile of shit. Hi, I'm Alex Kaiju. I'm Jasmine Witt. I'm Eli Watson. And I'm Stefan Myers. And you're listening to... Cryptid. Camp. Fire. Woo! <laughs> yeah, it worked. We got it, baby. Yeah! Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Cryptid Campfire. And, uh, I mean, let's not bury the lead today. Uh, where, what are we talking about? <laughs> We're talking about our favorite marsupial. Crash, Crash Bandicoot. Bandicoot. <laughs> oh, Talk, no. Ooh, they, they uh, reveal that there might be a Crash Bandicoot 4 coming out for the PlayStation 5. Oh. Uh, Today we're talking about the Drop Bear. Mm-hmm, and we're going back to Australia for this one. So the Drop Bear can be found in the densely forested regions of the Great Dividing Range in southeastern Australia. However, there are also some reports from southeast South Australia, Mount Lofty Ranges, and Kangaroo Island. Kangaroo Island? Yup. I can, I can just imagine. Who lives they, there? They have nothing but wombats. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that is some uh, misleading information. <laughs> false advertisement. So what exactly does a drop bear look like? Well, wait. Don't you want to know its scientific name first? Oh, yes. Please, share. Thylarctos <laughs> plummatus. Yes. Plummetus. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the in the middle is Christopher. <laughs> it's his middle name. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess just picture a larger version of a koala with razor sharp fangs and killer claws that drops from eucalyptus trees and attacks any non Australian. And and <laughs> Do you get uh and apparently you know so koala bears are actually kind of they're kind of you know medium sized when you see them you know you think they're probably tiny but you see pictures hold people holding them and they're a little you know they look a little hefty but yeah, they're a little decent size yeah but a drop bear they're like two twice the size yeah they're bigger and they they vary from a regular koala in color a little bit so a regular koala their fur is gray and white it helps them blend in with the eucalyptus trees while remaining stationary but the drop bear has like an orange and brown coat mm -hmm. and that helps it hide while moving through the treetops so instead of like being still and stationary and hiding it's more moving through the treetops and blending in with the light that comes through the leaves yeah, and that's that's even like uh, if it needs to be in the light because I think they're mostly nocturnal, from what I could gather. I actually didn't read anything about that. I, I don't know. I, yeah, I, don't I know got either. that they're mostly nocturnal. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> well, I got that it never sleeps. Ooh, because so, money never <laughs> sleeps. Money never uh, sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> Drop bear, Wall Street edition. Um, does anyone have how to? Guard yourself against I do. the drop bear. Please Tell share. us, sir. There's a there's a quite a bit of things you could do. One, practice your Australian accent. Oh, Don't yeah, go right. Kiwi, because they'll get you. They know the difference. Practice your accent. Unless you're already Australian, then you're ahead of the curve. Another another one you could do is put forks in your hair. That seems to be a way to re repel <laughs> the drop bear. So, I mean, if you're looking for that new hairstyle, go ahead and try it. You you want to get one of those, like, magnetic tuning forks because they kind of align with the magnetic north and disorient the drop bears from noticing you. There we go. Got you, got you to the right path. Then uh, another way I got is to rub Vegemite or, like, toothpaste. Another, one site said... To rub it behind your ears. Another site said to rub the Vegemite over your face, like SBF 50, which probably wouldn't what? smell that great. But 
What is Vegemite? It's like a sandwich spread, right? Yeah. It's, oh, I, I think so a lot I of people like, don't like it. I I want to say it's you know I, it's like a weird vegetables kind of pickle paste thing that you spread on bread and everyone says it's gross but yeah I enjoy it. Men without hats they uh, sang a song about how good it was from a tall man so who knows. <laughs> so a lot of those precautions sound really random but there is reasoning behind them. So the Vegemite and the toothpaste thing comes from the fact that drop bears are sensitive to strong natural odors. So putting a layer of those things on your sweat glands, you know, and in your underarms is usually pungent enough to repel mm-hmm. them. Yeah, maybe don't wear deodorant then, too. Maybe that'll help. Yeah. The fork thing is because, I mean, it is kind of self explanatory. You can kind of assume um, they're drop bears, so they're going to come out of the trees and land on your head. But if you have like a fork or something sharp braided into your hair that's upturned, they're going to see that and they're not going to want to jump out and do that. And then there is one more way to avoid being attacked, and that's just to stare it down. Because if you make direct what? eye contact with it, yeah. So they depend on the element of surprise. So if you're looking at it, it's not going to jump on you. So as long as you can keep your eyes to the trees and, and, you know, see them before they try and attack you, then they might not get you. Well, I also got oh, that they like don't that. cross salt circles, which I thought was kind of funny. Really? <laughs> well, I got... But how thick does the circle have to be? I don't know. The The image was of a guy putting salt around his tent. But how, like, thick is the salt? Like, is it, like, a lot of salt, or is it just, like, a little bit of it salt? It looked or? like a pretty good mound I, all around. I, I'd assume you probably want a consistent line of salt, you know? Yeah. I'm just wondering, because, you know, when I go to Australia and I have to guard myself, you know, how much salt, salt should I bring? <laughs> well, you know, that's the good thing, because if you don't have salt, I found that the one of the ways to keep drop bears from wanting to drop on you is to cover yourself in urine. Oh, goodness. Why? And it doesn't oh, even have to be your own. Oh, nice. I think that goes back to that pungent mm-hmm. smell thing. And you know what's crazy is, do you know there's a way to detect if there's a drop bear, like, in a tree, if you're not sure? How? Oh. So this comes from the actual uh, Australian Museum .net uh, .au. <laughs> it's a very long one. Sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, you figure it out. But they say if you lay on your flat on your back under a tree and you spit up, uh, if there's a drop bear in there, uh, he'll wake up and spit back at you. And that's their territory oh. warning that you can avoid that tree. You spit up into yeah. the tree? I'm and if, confused. And if, if the drop bear's in there, it'll spit back at you. I feel like this far. You must have to spit really far yeah. for it to see well, you or uh, get hit Australians by that. Australians can spit uh, six to eight feet at any given time. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is uh, textbook knowledge, dude. Get with the program, so- Eli. So they are a threat. However, it is good news to know that nobody has ever been killed by one. There's been people that have been attacked, and it usually results in, like, lacerations and bites and stuff like that. But no one's ever died. Uh, However, it's prey dies. I mean, it attacks humans, but it usually hunts other animals that are sometimes even bigger than it. Uh, Like uh, kangaroos and wallabies. Uh, And it We've already said that it ambushes by jumping from above, but it'll wait up to as long as four hours to make a kill. So it's like, it's kind of like a stalker. Like it'll stalk its prey until it's ready to jump down. Um, And then they can jump. Do you think it jumps from tree to tree? I would assume. I mean, it relies on the branches to carry its heavy weight because it's a pretty, it's it's a a pretty hefty creature and it's got powerful arms. It's a big chunk. It's a good climber. (laughs) That's why it falls on you and it stuns you. But when it hits, when it jumps out, uh, it usually stuns the prey. And if it's not too big, it'll take it back up so that it can eat without being annoyed by other predators. You got to admire the determination. Dude, that's pretty powerful. Well, you know what's crazy too is because, you know, they fall from a tree and, and that's how they stun their prey is the weight falls on them. Sometimes 
uh, depending on the prey, it'll break their neck by falling on them. And then, because they have the big sharp fangs, so apparently what they do is that they'll drop, pierce their fangs into the neck of their prey, so it starts bleeding out, and then they carry it up the tree, and so the blood empties out when they get to the top of the tree, and then they can start eating the prey. Mm. I I have this from National Geographic. Um, if you've ever gone camping, you might be told to beware the dreaded drop bear. There won't be a chase. You'll be you'll just be walking along, minding your own business, when a dark shape plummets onto you from above, pinning you down before you realize that you're being eaten alive by an overgrown koala. Ah. <laughs> yes, but you notice the verbiage plummet. Uh, you know, going back to its Latin name, plummetus. <laughs> plum, which means you know the plum kind of in the tree. And Metis, which means to fall, uh, but more into like the underworld kind of falling in a sense. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Anyways, should we re- <laughs> reveal the truth behind this matter? Yeah. Did Well, we've been talking about it like it's an actual animal. We haven't even been talking about it as if it's a cryptid. We've just been like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, this is we, a thing that we're, exists. We're, we're changing but... the name of the game, baby. We're telling you real animals that are a danger to you and your family. <laughs> Yes, but uh, I guess this is our <laughs> third time, you know, Hodag Part Three here. Uh, here we go. <laughs> the Hodagining. <laughs> yeah. So the drop bear is a hoax. Mm-hmm. The end. Yeah. Thanks for joining yeah. us, Bye, everybody. everybody. Thank you. <laughs> you know, from what I can tell, it's not like the Hodag or the Snallygaster to where it was used for, you know, to bolster someone's you know, reputation in any mm-hmm. way. It was just kind of used to scare tourists. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Vegemite stocks went through the roof. <laughs> that whole idea kind of seemed interesting to me because why would you, I mean, I guess if you're a local, you don't want a bunch of tourists around all the time. But like, if you do want to boost the economy, like you want the tourists to come and uh, I read something from a paleontologist named Dr. Sam Armin, uh, who said that the drop bear legend was something you'd apply to tourists because everyone has this idea about Australia, Australia being full of these deadly animals. When you tell someone about this thing that falls out of the tree, your neck, they just go, oh, yes, that sounds about right. Everything here wants to kill you. Oh, yeah. I mean, and some people don't even get the joke. I have this... Uh board uh, how do i how do i say this it's like yahoo answers but i'm trip advisor <laughs> and it, the the post mm-hmm. is drop bears how to avoid question mark and uh <laughs> the person says hi there i'm really worried about drop bears i have done my research on spiders and jellyfish but how do i avoid drop bears will they come into my hotel room i want to go to the blue mountains and the grand ocean drive will there be drop bears there it's really hard to find how dangerous they really are <laughs> so, they saw the photos and they were they got scared <laughs> i just think it's so funny <laughs> well there are a lot of travel websites that like post about it as if it's a real thing it's very tongue-in-cheek though um i did find a website as well and it has this website it has this listed on here it says um and if i mean if you use your common sense you can tell that it's a joke because it says The highest occurrences of recorded sightings usually begin around April 1st each year as the animals prepare prepare for the breeding season in early (laughs) summer. As with all travel, remain on your guard, be aware of your surroundings, and never approach a wild animal. If you have further concerns, feel free to discuss them with your local tour guide or any Australians you may know. They will be overjoyed to answer all of your drop bear related inquiries. Really, they just want to laugh at you. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I was going to say, it's funny because I found um, there, you know, you're talking about, you know, the trip advisor and, uh, you know, people, you know, keeping the drop bears around. There was an actual, uh, uh, like, Facebook kind of ad that was circulated around for a while, a couple of years ago. And it's this woman holding, like, a baby koala with a, a, ba- a bottle feeding it, but the bottle's, like, it's like a syringe full of blood. And, and it has like red eyes and it says orphan drop bear cub being fed human blood to survive and it takes you to an article about this australian zoo that like has these dry, like drop bear babies and it says 
Drop bear attack survivor groups are up in arms over local zoo's adoption of an orphaned uh, drop bear cub. The razor sharp fanged, red eyed, okay. vicious baby killer requires three times its own body weight in raw meat to sustain it. <laughs> its preferred meal, of course, is human flesh. To put things into perspective, that means that three other animals have to die to keep this little vicious, cute, carnivorous animal alive, and at least a liter of human blood <laughs> from the Australian Red Cross Red Cross Blood Services is being diverted away from people who may need it for transfusions. It's incredibly. Right? I, wow. I can only imagine if you're on, you know, you're on Facebook and you're like, "Oh man, Australia's crazy. They're just like killing zoo animals to feed this monster, and they're taking blood from the <laughs> banks to feed it." <laughs> well, Alex, earlier you mentioned the Australian Museum au, which is where I got some of my information as well, because they have an article that's written. As if the drop bear is a real animal that's recognized <laughs> by science. And they did this during what's called the silly season, which um, is a time in Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa around Christmas and New Year's. Uh, and they celebrate it. Just It's basically kind of like April Fool's, I guess. Um, but so during silly season back in 2010, the Australian Museum wrote this sheet about the drop bear which was picked up by crikey.com.au and the sydney morning herald and within four days over ten thousand people had viewed the fact sheet and they got so many comments from visitors and like concerns and stuff like that and accounts of drop bear encounters from online readers and then over christmas that year they set up a small display in the atrium featuring some artifacts which they said, quote, may or may not relate to actual drop bears, stating that you can make your own judgments on the drop bear evidence. Huh. Hmm. I, I was going to uh, say, I'm, I'm waiting for uh, this whole silly season known as 2020 to end. <laughs> right? Uh, I actually have a 2020 article talking about the drop bear and i'm not sure if this website is a joke or not um because it's from the from independent australia.net and they claim that australia has a misinformation a misinformation campaign against the drop bear to convince people that it's not real <laughs> yeah what? and so i guess australia is just trying to convince people that uh, the drop bear is a, is a hoax and these people at independent Australia are worried because because everyone believes it's a hoax no one was providing aid to drop bears during the wild bushfires that were happening earlier this year oh, no. so they think that mm -hmm. <laughs> the people at Aust independent Australia fear that the drop bears are now extinct oh my goodness it <laughs> it, interesting the, so many wall breaks yeah so i don't know if it was like if that's like a real site well there was a newscaster in january of this year back in 20 or back in 2020 back in january of 2020 there was a newscaster named debbie edward she was scottish and she went to the kangaroo island wildlife park in australia <laughs> and they freaking punked her hard they said that they were gonna introduce her to a drop bear and she oh, took no. it as she says hook line and sinker and they put her in full gear with like a face covering a chest protector boots heavy duty gloves and all of this and everyone was acting like they were all super anxious and afraid of bringing this creature out and they just handed her a regular koala and she was so nervous and so scared and she felt really silly when it was over. But when I was watching the video, I kind of got nervous just because I guess I've never really looked closely at a koala's face. Like their little beady eyes and their like like facial expressions. Oh, it just weirded me out. Because like, they're, they're, we're so used to like like cartoon versions of the koalas you know as our main you know interaction with them so when you see one in real life you're like oh this guy's kind of kind of creepy looking yeah when they tricked her with this they told her that drop bear attacks were the third most common injury oh, in australian no. tourists 
now hold this deadly animal. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they also claimed that the drop bear has venomous fangs, which I think that's the only place that mm. I heard that out of all the yeah. places I've read about it. This, this uh, zookeeper was just like, yeah, it's got venomous Why fangs. Not? Um, however, the drop bear, uh, regardless of its, you know, if it's real or if Australia has a campaign of misinformation, misinformation against it i don't know Mm -hmm. uh it was kind of real at some point in time a say say again i just said in a way yes it kind of existed (laughs) uh so otherwise known or the thylacolio carnifex aka the marsupial lion which we Mentioned briefly last week during the mm-hmm. pilot scene. Um, while not really looking like a lion, it looked more like a, a koala mm-hmm. or a wombat with just kind of a, like the the teeth were different. It says it had sharp teeth all the way around. So it wasn't like. Um, well, yeah, that's, that's what's cra- crazy is. Uh, so it's called the marsupial lion, but it has mm-hmm. more of like a kind of like a wombat uh, koala head. And mm-hmm. it has more like rodent teeth and yeah. these two big giant uh, front teeth that it would use as like a – they described it as a uh, – like a bolt cutting device. And it was so strong mm-hmm. that it could cut through. They say that you know it could easily cut through flesh because I guess it was possibly carnivorous. Cause- it was definitely carnivorous. Definitely carnivorous. No, okay, cool because it has like 200 pounds of just – this like the nightmaric prehistoric rodent lion roaming around yeah it 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 resembles a koala in the shape of the head but when it comes to the body it i don't think it resembles a koala at all like if you look up pictures it does kind of look like the body is lion like right. it's right. like lean and kind of more stretched out with a long tail yeah. and so i was also reading according to national geographic um, they supposedly lived in caves that other animals couldn't get out of. So mm-hmm. if they, they would fall down a cave, you know, it would be able to eat its prey and then climb out, suggesting that it was a strong climber, aka it was able to climb trees and drop onto prey. Oh my god! Exactly. Oh, and they know this because there were claw marks found on the inside of these caves, and the mm-hmm. only animal that it could the claw marks the claw marks could have belonged to were the marsupial lion yeah and that and it's pretty it, neat it, it's crazy because it would extinct what forty six thousand years ago they say yeah in addition to its like bolt cutting like teeth and whatnot it also had a huge thumb that they used to disembowel its prey oh Ooh. like Talk a dumb. like a velociraptor <laughs> So the cave markings that we were just talking about, those can be found in southwestern Australia's tight entrance cave. Uh, They're V-shaped marks, and as I said, only the marsupial lion matches the size and anatomy required to make those largest scratch marks. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the smaller scratches they think could have been made by other animals trying to find their way out of the cave, like Eli mentioned, such as possums and tasmanian tigers <gasps> but um oh. it is assumed that the smaller scratches were left by marsupial lion joeys so baby marsupial lions who were raised in the safety of the cave and interesting eli already said made the assumption that if it can climb through this cave then it can climb through trees but detailed explanation uh, coming from National Geographic says this, many claw marks within TEC, tight entrance cave, are located on steep surfaces despite more gradual inclines being available on other sides of the central rock pile and boulder. Uh, And the entrance to the cave itself appears to have been a steep deadfall for other creatures. So they got stuck. This suggests that the marsupial lion was a skilled and confident climber, uh, clamoring in and out of a cave that trapped other species. And so if it could haul itself around rocky caves, then it could almost certainly scale trees, which is where we get the koala-esque eucalyptus tree jumping. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
So it um, keeps its, you know, last name, Carnifex, all the way until it gets into the tree, and that's when it becomes Plummetus. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's when it starts, uh, you know, dropping on cavemen, and it eats Fred Flintstone. <laughs> <sighs> that's funny did you guys get anything um where they talk about the mammoth drop bear <laughs> <laughs> i what? looked at a picture briefly what it's is this so funny. it's like they call it australia's <laughs> bigfoot and uh they talk about the common drop bear is like a meter tall and the mammoth drop bear is five <laughs> meters tall oh. they call it australia it's australia's <laughs> bigfoot quote unquote and they talk about how um, they used it in World War One to smash tanks. And stuff. <laughs> Dude, whoa! <laughs> Hilarious. It says they trained them to squash invading tanks and vehicles. Oh my god! They're just like you know they're trying to get to the center line. They're like we got to get through those krauts and help the Jerry's win the war. <laughs> and they're like, but they got mustard gus and they got the red baron out there. And they say we got the mammoth mega drop bear <laughs> and it Dude. comes out on chains and the tree is supposed to support the weight of that thing it uproots the trees <laughs> who knows <laughs> i don't know you know what that kind of reminds me uh, of this is a slight tangent but um uh when they were making peter jackson's king kong they did an april fool's joke where they said they oh. were gonna do do the son Remake, of kong yeah. sequel but it would be they would find the son of Kong and bring him into World War Two, and they would like strap machine guns onto him. So he would be like, you know, a giant gorilla <laughs> that had machine guns shooting Nazis. And that's what that <laughs> reminds me of. <laughs> well, you know, what's crazy, too, is, um, yeah, because they, they were like, we're making son of Kong. Because when they made the original King Kong, you know, back in the 30s, they're like, oh, we want to make a sequel. I'm like, well, I don't know. What, which, which should the sequel be? And they're like, what about? King Kong versus Frankenstein, <laughs> and it was gonna be uh, Doctor Frankenstein makes like a uh, like a giant Frankenstein's monster out of like a dead elephant, and it fights King Kong to death in like the bit oh. the middle of San Francisco. Make what? a yeah. Frankenstein. Mega and that would have been the sequel to King Kong. <laughs> Good lord! Uh, so if the, only. Anyway, there. There is no sequel to King. There should not be a sequel to King Kong. <laughs> it's, it's an open and shut case. Anyways, so what do we have as in terms of Drop Bear's popularity? Well, there's a lot of movies. Well, I shouldn't say a lot. There's a handful of short films and feature length films that I saw uh, surrounding the idea of the Drop Bear. One of them being called Drop. It's the struggling workers of an Aussie sheep farm confront a terrifying creature of folklore, but survival means reconciling with a past they want forgotten. And this is a fairly recent film that's supposed to be made. I watched the trailer on YouTube, and there is an IMDb page for it, but the website that they list in the official trailer does mm. not exist. So I don't know where they are in terms of pre- or post-production for this one, but... <laughs> Add it to your upcoming. Yeah. Yeah, Keep we want drop. Clean. Drop the drop now. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Uh, and you said there was other movies as well, Jasmine? Um, I didn't write those ones down because they didn't appeal to my interest. But there's like a couple short films. I don't even remember what they're called. But if you can look it up on YouTube, there's a couple of them. Um, my favorite thing that I read about, though regarding pulp culture is a book called drop bear which is a children's book written by a guy named ian coat he has a really cute on the drop bear there's kind of a surprise ending to this children's book but it's part of mythic australia which is a magical aussie universe filled with drop bears hoop snakes plus a swag of unique creatures only to be found in the enchanting land down under so basically this is like an online and 
online community and publishing company uh, that's geared towards Australian kids with the hopes of encouraging them to share the love for the country with colorful characters, creatures, and mythics, uh, oddities, and slang. They have books, games, learning activities, resources for teachers, and the illustration is pretty cool, actually. Like, I was really surprised about this whole little community that exists for trying to get Aussie kids interested in mythical and magical creatures from Australia. Ooh, that's pretty oh, that's cool. cool. Nice. I know there's a um, Drop Bear Lane in New South Wales. Oh, really? Yeah, it got its name like three years ago. Uh, that's funny. Drop Bear Lane. And there's just nothing but shrubs. Why? That doesn't make any sense. They don't exactly. take no chances. There's also, we were talking about travel sites earlier, and there's actually a travel um, company, a tour company that's called Drop Bear Adventures. And they claim on their website, verified drop bear sightings are few and far between. So many visitors refuse to believe that they exist. We can't provide you with any substantial proof of the existence of drop bears, but we do suggest you are always on the side of caution and carry a supply of Vegemite. Dude, it's because of the misinformation campaign. <laughs> nope. It's just a scam to sell more Vegemite. Yeah, John Hamm is just in a building. He's like, I got a fantastic idea. It, 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 or like, you know, Christmas Story when he solves the, the mystery uh, Dakota ring. And it just says, <laughs> buy more Ovaltine. And he's like, it's an ad. It's a damn milk ad. Uh, they're tricky. Uh, but is that I it mean, for Drop Bear Pop Culture? Or, I mean, that's all I got. You know, it, until the Renaissance when it takes off and becomes the next DreamWorks <laughs> <Really>? movie. <laughs> they're going to do what they did to the Yeti with uh, Abominable. What they did with, uh, they're going to do with the Drop Bear. The only other interesting thing that I read about, which only came up on one source, but someone said it's widely assumed that drop bears start out as koalas and become infected by a disease similar to rabies. So not the drop bears aren't just vicious versions of koalas. They are zombie. Zombie koalas. Wow. What a concept. Ooh, that, that'd be crazy. Cause do you, have you heard about zombie ants? No. Yeah. There, so there's there's a fungus that will attach itself to an ant, and then it'll start sprouting. It'll sprout like a little mushroom out of the ant's head, and it'll yeah, control yeah, yeah. the ant. What? Yeah. And so yeah, it's like a real thing. And yeah. And, and so the and so it uh, it's uh, like Parasect from uh, Pokemon is inspired by this, but the the ant now controlled by the fungus will go climb all the way up to like the topest point of like a tree or a leaf or whatever, and a bird will come by and eat that. The fungus is now in the bird. The bird poops, spreads the fungus around. Freaking wild, man! Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's cra and there's all other kinds of like different funguses that turn bugs into like weird zombies. But imagine a koala is eating the eucalyptus. It eats a new strain of some fungus, and it 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 the fungus makes its teeth grow out more, and kind of gets a thirst for blood, and it, fall, it climbs up trees and falls down them, and every time it falls, spores <laughs> shoot out of its eyes or something. Good Lord. Yeah, and have you heard of a uh, chronic wasting disease? Uh, uh, is that the? It's what's uh, that? It like affects larger animals, so like deer. It it's also known as a zombie deer disease, mm. to where like the animal will just start uh, decomposing, but it'll just keep going as if mm -hmm. it's okay. Ugh. And I'm not sure. It's um, I guess it's related to like mad cow disease also, but. Yeah, there's a couple of like zombie diseases floating around. They're they're out there. Uh, but yeah, that's um. Who knows? Maybe it's a fungus infested koala. That'll be the new. Maybe it'll be, it'll be a new Pokemon too. I would like to interrupt this program with a special <laughs> message to one of our biggest fans out there, known as Michaela. Happy birthday! Ooh yeah! Happy birthday! <laughs> well, happy birthday! I hope you have a wonderful day. Coming at you from the future to the past. Yeah. I know. I yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just found out today that the day that we're recording is your birthday, so the message is gonna be a little bit late on your end, but please know we are thankful for you and we are hoping that you had a wonderful celebration. 
Now your birthday is cemented in podcast history. <laughs> True that. I think uh, it's time that we end the discussion of the drop bear and we drop that bad boy in the cryptid coliseum. Hey. Hey. All right. Ooh, and we, we got a treat for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Our very own Eli Watson will be presenting a story. Yes, and this is different from the last time I read the story, because Alex usually writes the Cryptid Coliseum battles, but he has since passed the torch on, and I think we're all going to be taking turns writing one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I guess I'm kicking it off, and I'm going to start yeah. reading this one. So. I hope, I hope you guys enjoy. The, the stakes are I'm pretty excited. high. We open on dust swirling around. We hear the spectators of the Coliseum screaming loudly. As the dust settles, we see disfigured bodies laying dead on the ground. Ooh. <laughs> Arrows Ugh. sunken into their bulbous heads. Ooh. The Pukwudgie stands victorious atop of the now craft <laughs> Blue Granada. One last melon head, slumped in the driver's seat, looks up to his executioner. He reaches a handout, a plea for help, only to be met with a swift arrow in his eye. Jesus. Oh. <laughs> yes. The Pukwudgie raises his arms, absorbing the love from the crowd as they cheer, Pukwudgie, 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 over and over again. But the victory is short-lived as a droning sound fills the air. The Pukwudgie looks up to see a large cargo plane. He preps an arrow and takes aim, letting it fly only when he has his sights on the pilot. The arrow soars through the sky, out of the Colosseum, striking the pilot through the neck. Ooh. The plane begins to lurch as the pilot clings to life. With his last breath, he slipped, He slaps a big red button and says, <laughs> see you in hell, as it crashes <laughs> into the audience and explodes into a million Incredible. pieces. Oh my god! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> the bottom of the cargo plane opens, dropping all of the items in the cargo hold. A eucalyptus tree in something else. The Pukwudgie can't quite make out what the fallen gray object is, but as it plummets towards him, he can feel its energy. Raging intensity sends chills down the Pukwudgie's spine as the drop bear opens its eyes to glare at the at its next victim. Ooh. It snarls, flashing its razor-sharp teeth as it plummets at a near supersonic speed. The Pukwudgie draws up its bow. The drop bear spreads its horrifying claws, ready to annihilate his non-Australian foe. And as the two near each other, we cut to black. And we ask you, the listeners, who wins? Oh! <laughs> that was awesome! Oh, good lord. <laughs> that was very funny. Ooh, that was a good one. <laughs> I don't know. I loved I just, it. Sometimes Alex gets really violent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've I don't never know. seen an actual death before yeah, in the Coliseum. Before. That's true. But I just really wanted the drop bear to fight the Pukwudgie, and I couldn't help but think it would be a missed opportunity yeah. if I didn't capitalize on. <laughs> Ooh yeah! Ooh, and, and this plays like uh like a sequel, if yeah. you will. So let's say let's say like you know the original 1980s horror film Fright Night. You're like this movie's awesome, and then you see the sequel that came out five years later and it throws everything out the window and the characters act different and you're like i don't know what's happening and i don't like this so i discontinue it from the franchise you can you can treat the this this battle like the kingdom of the crystal skull if you want are you no i loved it but if if people got problem with any finalized battles happening ah. they can take a hike <laughs> I see, I see. I mean, okay, so in my defense, I looked back. Apparently, I forgot to create an actual cryptid battle post oh? for the Pukwudgie. So there was no official ruling on who would win. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So, you know, I just <laughs> creative liberty. Yeah, <laughs> you just awesome. deleted the post. And it's canon, too. <laughs> no. All right. But, uh,. But yeah, that was about it. That was great. So that was the drop there, and that was his epic battle in the Coliseum. But yeah, I I think that's about it for this week's episode, huh? Yeah, I mean, I think that's about it. So if I want to find Alex on the 
internet. How do I go about doing that? Ooh, well, if you want to find me on Instagram and Twitter, you can find me at Alex Daikaiju. That's uh, Alex. Uh, 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 wait, uh, Alex Daikaiju. Alex D A I K A I J U. <laughs> Uh, be sure to be sure to check out my Instagram. I like to post a lot of cool art about monsters and cryptids and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, oh, I gotta read my sources today too. I would be remiss. Uh, I used uh, HuffingtonPost.com, AustralianMuseum.net.ShrimpOnTheBarbie, uh, <laughs> Snops.com, CryptidWiki.com, uh, some Reddit, and some MuseumOfHoaxes.com. Nice. And uh, and well, if I wanted to find the shining jewel of the Nile in Hollywood, that is Jasmine May with, where could I find you? (laughs) You can find me on Twitter and Instagram as well. My name is the same on both, Jasmine May with, J-A-S-M-I-N-E-M-A-E-W-I-T-H. Today, my information came from the Australian the herald sun huffington post youtube user nurchin drop bear adventures wikipedia imdb great value vacations mythic australia national geographic and the australian broadcasting corporation awesome and uh well if i wanted to kick the drop bear out of the tree and drop the mic at the same time i'd have to ask stefan myers where i could find him online quite a feat you can find me on instagram at myers stefan that's m-y-e-r-s s-t-e-f-f-e-n and i pretty much got my information from everything alex and jasmine said so i'm not going to repeat it (laughs) uh do it anyway (laughs) just kidding make me ah and finally uh i've been having some trouble sleeping at night there's been a portal to hell that's been opening up with the ragged remains of a cargo plane pilot who, with his bloody stumps of a hand, writes in blood every morning, Eli Watson. <laughs> and I have to ask, where can I find this online? Well, you can follow me at the Eli Watson on Instagram. That's where I share my digital photography. Ooh, good stuff, uh, too. Yeah, and that's... Yeah, there's cute pictures of puppies oh, yeah. on there. Yeah. Um, and so my sources for this week's episode come from National Geographic, Australian Geographic, hoaxes.org, TripAdvisor, Mashable.com, and the independent Australian.net. Woohoo. And, well, we are Cryptic Campfire. And, uh, Eli, uh, what do you uh, run for the Cryptic Campfire? You can follow us as a whole at cryptid campfire on instagram twitter and facebook and we have cryptidcampfire.com where you can get your official cryptid campfire t-shirt we even have a patreon where for five dollars a month you get exclusive app access to episodes early access to episodes to our weekly episodes along with exclusive images and videos. Ooh, and exclusive Tall Tale episodes where we talk about creepy urban legends and weird things. And uh, we also have an email. Well, if you want to email us at crypticampfirepodcast at gmail.com. Oh, yeah. Send us an email. I always try to respond. Yeah. And if I don't, um, don't, don't take it personally. <laughs> and uh, I think that's about it for us here. Uh, you guys got anything else you want to throw out? Not at the moment. Just thanks for listening. As I know that it's been a, a bit of a struggle with quarantine. We've had technical mm-hmm. difficulties and setbacks, but if you're still listening, we're still very thankful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And wash yeah. your hands. <laughs> yeah, wash your hands and stay tuned for next week, guys. Bye. See ya. Bye. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.